we tend to buy 10% of all the mm. deals that we put up because we put our money where our mouth is and when investors feel pain, we feel, we feel sure. pain and when we feel joy, they feel joy. And there's plenty of guys out there uh, or girls promoting deals that mm. don't have any skin in the game. Our view is, is that unless you can see an opportunity that's going to return three times money, don't even bother. It's not worth the time. There's too much of this sugar chasing, I call it, yeah. where it's like, oh, I'm getting this phenomenal deal and I'm 5% cheaper and I'm going to get yeah. this and it's going to be, a, and I'm, I'm the king of the world. And very rarely have I seen that pay off. Is a habit that you've, uh, that you've followed to help you build wealth? Private markets investments are investors can find some real value. I find the best way to learn is learn from someone who's done it before and given it a go. Hi, I'm Travis Miller, host of Grow Your Wealth podcast. Thanks for joining me here today. On these podcast sessions, we're going to talk through how uh, certain investors have navigated the bumpy road of investing, whether it be through business or investments in general. Thanks for listening today. Today, for our very first episode, I'm joined with David Baxty, partner at uh, Coogee Capital. David is a visionary leader who's had a remarkable journey through the realms of business and finance. Begin his career at Arthur Anderson Corporate Finance and Rothschilds Australia, David's expertise in the resources sector quickly emerged. His path led to Goldman Sachs, where he navigated m and waters across diverse sectors such as industrials, telecommunications and financials. In 2004, David joined Richard Branson's family office from Sydney to Shanghai and Singapore to Geneva. David orchestrated travel and tourism investments, eventually becoming CEO at Global Blue, positioned in Geneva and backed by Silver Lake and Partners Group. 2017 saw him return to Australia where he assumed the role of managing director of the industrials business at West Farmers. After leaving West Farmers, David partnered with Tom Hardwick to launch Kuji Capital. Coogee Capital partners with founder-led private companies and family businesses to assist them along the path to liquidity. Thanks for joining me today, David. And I'm interested to hear about your, you know, your story and also Coogee Capital, who we've uh, worked with at a professional level a number of times. So it's interesting and, and you know, great to see that business growing. What would be great to start off with just a potted summary of you know, who you are, how would you get started in life? Yeah, look, I, I suppose I was... I was lucky to have a really strong family behind me. Um, yeah, mum, mum was an entrepreneur. Uh, she had her own business. I suppose from my earlier times, I can remember her coming home with, you know, business proposals, <laughs> you know, resumes, whatever it might be. She was in recruitment. Uh, she happened to be, you know, Andrew Banks, who then started Morgan & Banks, sort of one of the doyens of entrepreneurship in Australia. She happened to, to start her career with him. So I was always sort of exposed to that sort of entrepreneurship um and but no we, we moved around a bit but i suppose i was always fortunate to um you know find the right path um, I'll, I'll never forget sitting down with the careers advisor at my high school at the end of, end of year 11 and he said look what do you want to do and i said oh look i think i'd love to go to law school that'd be fantastic and he <laughs> said look based on your marks to date how about you think about a trade <laughs> academics probably aren't for you and that was a bit of a wake-up call for me because that was the first point of my life where I had to sort of make a choice to really dedicate myself to something. I'd done a fair bit of sport and everything before that. And that was the point where I, I really, I probably worked harder in year 12 than I've ever worked in my life and managed to get myself into law school right. and uh, completed, a, completed a double degree and then went on the career that, you, that you've just talked about. That's very impressive. Okay, now could you walk us through your career journey? Uh, share two or three pivotal moments that led you to where you are today. Yeah. Obviously, your mother was a strong influence in your, at a personal personal level. Yep. Interesting, sort of the broader broader career story. Yeah, look, I just I, I came out of uni like all of us. I think I yep. sent probably 80 applications out yeah. to try and sort of find a landing point and, and was fortunate enough when Arthur Anderson Corporate Finance was around uh, to land a job with a phenomenal sort of crew there and was always interested in sort of helping companies find their next path. Um, and that was a phenomenal grounding experience. I think, you know, Arthur Anderson, I, I had the, the, the opportunity to go to St. Charles, which is their training, you know, training facility over in, over in America a couple of times in my first year. So that classic sort of grad, just get exposed to everything, um, you know, was, was, was a really good landing point, but pretty quickly worked out that I wanted to do something that was a little bit, a little bit broader. And so I managed to find myself, you know, into, into Rothschild, which is uh, led by Ronnie Beaver at the time. Um, spent about a year there and then Goldman was starting to scale up in Australia. I think I was employee number four wow, yeah. in Australia at Goldman. They were a private partnership. 
bit of a brass plate. Mm. Um, didn't quite know it was going to work out, but they had some phenomenal people there and joined and spent the next sort of eight or nine years with them, effectively learning to read, write and add up. <laughs> and it was just a phenomenal, I suppose, apprenticeship. And gotcha. I spent a bit of time in the UK around 99, 2000 and Branson, uh, Richard Branson became sort of one of my clients sort of helping him through a few things. I came back to Australia and just one of those fortuitous moments where he was scaling Virgin Blue, the airline as it was. And I, like, like any good opportunistic banker, yeah. put my hand up and said, oh, you know, Richard, do you need a hand? Yeah. And next thing you know, we were away to the races because Ansett fell over. Gotcha, and we yeah. ended up selling half of it to Patrick Corporation, Chris Corrigan. And we ended up IPOing it a little, little, little after. And Richard rang me and he said, oh, look, you know, do you know anyone who might be able to help me with my, my family office? And I, sort of being the dutiful banker, you know, rang around and said, oh, does anyone want to help Richard out? And we had a whole bunch of candidates. And it took me about six months to work out the fact that actually it's a job that I wanted. Yeah, for sure. And I had to sort of climb off my ivory tower and ask him, oh, you know, would you think about me? And he said, absolutely. And, and sort of the, spent the next 10 years with him, you know, around the world. Oh. And so I've had to think about my pivotal moments in life. It was Arthur Anderson taking a punt on me. Yep. You know, and sort of saying, you know, there's a kid who... You know, neither of my parents finished high school, neither of my parents went to university. And so it was all a bit new for all of us. And that they took a punt on me, which was great. And then Richard, you know, and I spent a bit of time with him, you know, with right place, right time and happened to get the sort of next leg of career. And, wow. and, uh, and, and he, he then taught me, I thought, you know, Goldman had taught me to read, write and add up. And Richard taught me to be a human being. He yeah, taught he me to you. actually how to interact with people, um, how to take some of that Goldman Ivory Tower and apply it into the real world. Um, and that's where I probably became an investor. It was yeah, gotcha. the seminal moment for me was I'd been with Richard full time for, I don't know, probably three months and something had come up with one of the businesses. And I wrote him this beautiful seminal email, a Goldman email, yeah. you know, Richard, we've got three options, ABC and here's all the pros and cons. And he said, and he said, David, that's all wonderful. What are you going to do? And that was the moment where you actually learnt to take responsibility sure. for the decisions you're about to take. It's one thing to be a banker and achieve great outcomes. It's yeah. another to actually make a decision for sure. and live with them yeah. for the next 10 years. And that, that was the moment for me where you sort of start to grow up a bit and, and I hope I never look back. Yeah. It's amazing how important decision making is. So many bankers and you know, people in your career can analyze a transaction yeah. To death, and they yeah. can analyze it for months, but they just cannot pull the trigger and make a decision. So at yeah. some point, you've got to say, "Yep, makes sense. It's got a risk and return, and I'm prepared to trade." Yeah, and it's that it's that uncomfortable feeling, you know, in your stomach where you realize yeah. there's no way back. For sure. And you got to you know, whether it's starting a business, whether it's starting a new career, whether it be marrying a life partner, whatever it might be. You know, it's that moment where you're like, "I, I don't know all the facts. I don't sure. quite know how it's going to turn out." But it's trusting that gut instinct to lean into something and you get it wrong every now and again, but hopefully sure. you get more of them right. And, and, and Richard, Richard taught me that. Yeah, it's good. Very good lesson. Yeah. So, I mean, looking at your career, what about networks? How important is the networks you develop through your career? Look, I, I, I've never been a networker as such. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I, I tend to probably work more with people that I've known and trusted and seen them in the trenches. Yeah, you know, we at, at Virgin Group, we never used really recruitment agencies. Mm. It was very much seeing people we saw on the other side. Yeah. And they might be you know, frenemies, right? They might mm. be people we're competing sure. with. And it's like, I really like the way that guy's gone about that. Yeah. And I'd, I'd like to bring him on the journey. So for me, you know, it's about, um, you know, the people that I've managed to sort of you know, have around me for, for, for some time. And I've had people you know, like Mark Blackman, who mm. joined me from Goldman into Virgin and then from Virgin Group into Virgin Active. And now Mark's then joined our yeah. team at, at, at Coogee. Yeah. The same with Kerry Hoffman, uh, who joined from GE Capital, you know, sort of 20 years ago. Mm. They're still sort of part of the family. Sure. And for me, uh, Tom Hardwick, my partner at Coogee Capital, we were riding bikes together sort of 20 years ago, yeah. had no real instinct that we were going to put a business together. But you see, yeah, there's nothing like seeing someone when they're 200 Ks in into a bike ride, it's not quite going mm. the way everyone thought. It's all a bit sort of nasty there might have been a flat tire it might be a bit cold and you see how people react to that and they're the people you want to be with over the longer term and yeah. so that my networks are really built around those sorts of, those sorts of experiences yeah it's interesting i mean i think of look at our partners I'm, I'm actually working with half the my colleagues from previous jobs i worked in so you yeah. sort of you find your people you like to work with and if you can work with them again you sort of you bring them in so it's, yeah, it's, well, it's like i'm hugely um distrusting of that 90 minute interview process 
Yeah, we can sure. all be on best behavior for 90 minutes. For sure. Right. Yeah. But if you spent time with someone and you've seen them in the trenches, yeah. particularly when they're on the other side and you mm. see how they act, yeah. uh, I put a lot of store in that. Right. And, sure. and, and that served me pretty well. And actually the times where I've made mistakes have been times where I haven't had that depth of experience with someone. And so the whole, um, I suppose, genesis of Goodyear Capital was mm. around finding founders that have taken that leap. They built businesses. They want some help. Yeah, you know, they've been in the trenches and you can be in the trenches with them. They don't want to sell out. They don't mm. want to sort of cut ties and run. They, they want to come on the journey with us. Sure. Yeah, it sounds good. What have you invested your time, energy and money in over the years and why and how's that, how's that led to where you are today? And this is more on a sort of a personal level, personal investments. Yeah. Look, I think um, time-wise, I've always been someone who's enjoyed exercise, you know, yeah. sort of, you know, challenges. So, and bike riding has been probably the dominant sort of part of that. And it's nothing like getting on a bike and cycling through some of the be most beautiful parts of the world. Sure. Just that personal Zen time and mm. challenge, right? There's, there's nothing like challenging yourself. And like, I'm not the skinniest bloke in the world, but being able to get up some pretty big hills uh, has always been a challenge. And I've, yeah. and I've done that with a group of mates for the last 15 years pretty consistently. And and you form pretty close bonds yeah, when you've sure. been in those sort of situations. So that's the personal side. I think you know, family plays a pretty big role. I've been married to Selena for 25 years. I've got a couple of, you know, three great kids. Um, and I think that's the ultimate test of, you mm. know, are you true to yourself and, yeah, you know, do the people around you know what you're all about? Um, and I'm pretty proud of the sort of family unit that, that we've created. And then from a professional side, uh, it's been that point of investing in people that you sort of trust and understand. Um, and so, you know, everything from investing with Rob and you mm. guys when you started iPartners, just did I really understand what you were trying to do? Not really. Am I incredibly proud of what you created? Bloody mm. oath. Um, and so from a professional investing perspective, it's been about – you know, really backing the individual first mm. and foremost. So do I trust and do I respect and do I believe that this person is 100% committed to what we're trying to achieve? And then clearly you want to look at the business plan and make sure that they're not missing anything that you might be able to add. But really apart from that, you're saying to them, look, if you're in, I'm in. Yeah, for let's sure. Let's get on with it. Yeah, I can see you applying that to your current business. Are you looking at sort of the founders and private companies, you know, you're skinning the game and alignment of interest or critical critical part of investing look everything we do at the moment uh and tom and i are pretty aligned on this although we're very into you know, very different characters you know we tend to buy 10 percent of all mm. the deals that we put up because we put our money where our mouth is and when investors feel pain we'll feel we feel sure. pain and when we feel joy they yeah. feel joy so it's pretty aligned yeah. the easiest question for investor to ask is how much money are you putting in and if the number's zero Pretty quick, easy to say no. Exactly Maybe right. And there's plenty of guys out there uh, or girls pro promoting deals that mm. don't have any skin in the game, right? Sure. And and I probably the one thing I've learned from Richard is, um, you know, we, we backed entrepreneurs, right? We found people that had an idea, were willing to put it out there, get into it, and they were either willing to leave their current job and mm. have a really red hot go, or they were willing to sort of you know, bet their careers on the fact that they were going to pull this thing off and, and put their own money to work, put the house on the line. Yeah. There's nothing like a motivator like that to actually make something work. Yeah. Eating's important. A little bit. Yeah. And there's nothing like that moment of truth of, am I willing to put myself on the line? And I, I don't have a lot of trust in people who, who aren't. Because sure. it's, it's one thing to be a promoter. It's another thing to be an entrepreneur. For sure. Now, can you share your story with money and investments? Yeah, so I suppose, look, um, yeah, from my perspective, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I had the benefit of sitting inside the Virgin Group and putting some money to work in some deals where yeah, you're sitting beside or behind, frankly, one of the greatest entrepreneurs in the world being Richard sure. Branson, right? So um, yeah, that was where I learned to sort of be a bit of a passenger and and Richard, yeah, Richard's vision, Richard's brand, um, yeah, I think in terms of what he's done across mm, five or six different sectors is, is pretty incredible. So mm. I had a bit of a, I suppose, a, a blissed you know, introduction to investing not to mention, not to say that everything was perfect. I mm. mean, my biggest failure was we went to Shanghai. You know, I, I moved the whole family there. We were there for 18 months and we looked at every business venture under the sun. We read all the books about entering China that you could read. Mm. But you know, we, we still ended up losing quite a lot of money around a mobile phone venture because we just didn't quite understand the local regulatory environment and yep. just got ourselves caught up in what I call red pen risk. Gotcha. Uh, and I'd gone, I'd gone all in on that. And mm. that was a, that was a, $45 million loss for the group. Um, we had 600 people that were working for us at the time that were, that, that were dependent mm. and we couldn't get it off the ground. And so that was a bit of a wake up call for me. I'd come from this Goldman sort of 
yeah. ivory tower where nothing really went wrong mm. into one where you're the one responsible for for the loss and and i'll never forget the conversation i had with richard where we i had to sort of tell him that it hadn't quite worked out all that well and he'd mm. come to china a couple of times and helped me get a whole bunch of things done um and he said you know what have you learned from it and i sort of laid it out and then he said look you know at the end of the day it is what it is once you come to geneva and let's see how we can work things out and that was a huge show of faith. And I think mm. I'd showed that I'd learned something and I wasn't just sort of completely belligerent, but he was willing to take another bet on me to say, well, he's someone who's sort of, you know, got a few cuts around the edges. Yeah, he's learned sure. and, he's, and, he's, and he's moving on. Hey, if you're enjoying this, please subscribe on whatever platform you're using. It helps us build a community. We want to educate investors and this is what it's all about. Yeah, I mean, investing with people that have had managed through adverse investments, you know, managed through bad trades and they're coming out the other side, it's actually part of uh, part of investing. Things, uh, things. If you know, you'd be getting a zero return if you didn't take risk. Exactly right, and, and I think it's all about fronting up and mm. and being there to say, listen, hasn't gone according to plan. We've got our own money on the line. Yeah, yeah. You know, no one's more unhappy about this than I am. But we're into this. We're going to lean into it. We're going to fix it. For sure. Um, that's what our partners look for. Look for in terms of our our mm. sort of entrepreneur partners, and I think that's what our investors look for as well. Perfect. That's a good lead-in, actually. So, where did the idea, sorry, the idea for QG Capital come from? Where did your initial capital come from, and you know who su supported you across the journey? Yeah, look, I mean, look, Tom Hardwick, my business partner, and I, uh, uh, we come from reasonably similar backgrounds in that Tom built an incredibly successful business in guardian childcare from sort of sure. one centre to one hundred and eighty, and had multiple exits to private equity over the years, and sold it to Partners Group for, I think. Mm. $600 million at the end. And, and he was the driving force behind all of that. And I'd had obviously the experience with, with Branson and with, with a whole bunch mm. of different sort of portfolio companies. So we came together um, sort of three, four years ago on the basis of, well, look, we, we've sort of been with entrepreneurs. We know what it's like to see around mm. a few corners. Um, private equity can be an uncomfortable place a lot of the time for investors, mm. for, for entrepreneurs the first time around. Yep. And it's like, well, is there a way of actually helping people that have built $50 million businesses, help them see around a few corners, grow, find the right people, find the right systems, find the right capital to help them get to the next level. And, and it was our belief that we wanted to put our own capital to work first and foremost. Mm. So sort of 10, 15% of every deal, we said, well, we need to sort of back this for our own capital. Mm. Let's get a team around us that we trust and let's find entrepreneurs that, that we think we can help. And we try to say no really yeah. fast, sure. things that we just don't think we add any value to, whether it be real estate, yeah. Don't really have any value add on that. Resources, don't really have any value to add on that. Sort of high tech, don't really have any value to add. Everything gotcha. else we're sort of open to. Yeah. It's down to what, what the entrepreneur sort of USP is about. And there's nothing like an entrepreneur who's willing to say, I'm happy to keep 50. Mm. I want to come on the journey with you guys for the other 50. And I'm happy to go sort of almost JV with you. Yeah, That's gotcha. a real moment of truth, right? Sure. Because you're sort of getting married. Yeah, gotcha. and, it, and marriages, when they go wrong, can be pretty brutal. Yeah. And so we, we sort of trust in that model. It doesn't scale mm. particularly well. We're never going to run billions of dollars. You know, our aim is to have, you know, one to $200 million under management, but to have five or six companies that we really care about mm. and entrepreneurs that we really care about, uh, care about trying to grow them. Yeah. One of the things I see in good businesses are the ones that know exactly what they do do and what they don't do. And that was very well defined. And so, um, so what do you do differently? You think as far as the business goes relative to say competition and others? Look, I, I think, look, we're, we're probably at the same journey and have the same skills as some of our more established and more celebrated brethren um, who are willing to lean in and put real sort of time to work, you know, with, with the underlying companies. Yeah, you know, we're not financial engineers. You yeah. know, we don't have lots of leverage. In fact, yeah. we have no leverage in, in, in most of our deals. Um, so we don't really deal a lot with banks. Yeah, you know, every now and again, we'll have a little bit of a facility here and there, but it's not a four times, you know, sort of mm. EBITDA debt sort of leverage where we're just trying to play the, the maths of financial leverage. This is true, what I'd call operational leverage. So you're driving sales, gotcha. you're driving product adjacency, you're driving geographic market expansion, um, and you're, you're bringing to the table either investors or partners or customers that can genuinely help the business under, you know, underneath us grow. Yeah, and, sure. and, and you're saying to the entrepreneur, where do you want to go? And they say, well, I want to go to Queensland. And it's like, yeah. okay. Let's work out who the best five customers are for you. Mm. And let's use, I suppose, some of our experience to try and tap into that group where, you know, someone's starting out um, and they've done well in a certain market mm. and they need a little bit of help to sort of crack the next market. We can help them do that. Yeah, gotcha. 
Very good. And what was the biggest shift in your career? I think I know the answer to this given our discussion, but interested, you know, the biggest shift in your career, the step that occurred. But the biggest shift was moving from Goldman in, into yeah. Virgin. Gotcha. Right? That, that moment of there's no one else to rely on. Yeah, it's, for sure. You are. And, and the one thing that many people probably don't realise about uh, Richard Branson is that he's probably the most um, risk tolerant, uh, <laughs> um, delegated leader that I've ever come across in my life. Oh yeah, gotcha. So Richard would ring up, never never came to a board meeting, never read a board paper. He purely relied on the people that he spoke to and, and, yeah. and what they told him about what was going on in the business. And so that moment of, yeah, I'm not sitting in an ivory tower surrounded by thousands of people. I'm, this is sort of me yeah, and, sure. and it's up to me to deliver. Yeah. Um, and Richard's mantra in terms of competition and conversation and all those sorts of mm. things was cash in his pocket is cash in our pocket. Yeah, and so there was a hundred percent alignment from, from that perspective yeah. and his ability from 40,000 feet to zero in on, um, where someone wasn't telling him the truth was truly extraordinary. Seriously. So his ability to ring a baggage handler at the airline or uh, he'd receive a tweet from a customer on, 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 on an aircraft somewhere who hasn't had a great experience and he would ring me at two o'clock in the morning cause I'd be in Australia and he'd be mm. you know, wherever he was. And to say, do you realize what's happened here? And it's not that he expected me to know what had happened. Mm. He expected me to go away, find out what had happened, yeah, find sure. out why it happened, and then what we're going to do about it. And, and therefore, his idea, and it taught me a lot about, mm. I think I see a lot of guys these days focused on spreadsheets and P&Ls and outputs. Yeah. And we spend a lot of our time now, and Rich taught me this, focused on inputs. So how happy are staff? Yeah. How happy are customers? What are people telling us that's going right or wrong? Mm. Listen to that. They're the inputs into the business. Yeah. If you get that right, the outputs become a bit of a fait accompli. Sure. And it's it's a risk because you think, well, I, I want cash flow or I want EBITDA. Yeah. It's like, mate, if you don't know what's causing that, mm. then you're sort of wasting your time. Yeah. Um, so that's that's what I learned from him. And I think that's what entrepreneurship's all about. Sure, man. In a way, it's akin to training for a bike race, right? A little bit. A bit of the, the training. If you don't do the training, it shows you're not, up. You're not going to finish it, right? <laughs> you so don't it's all get about up the, the hill. The effort beforehand. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of talk these days about, um, you know, why there's so much potential anxiety out there with with people. And I think it's about a lot of people focus on the output. They focus sure. on the results. And I think, as we've just talked about, mm. you don't get the results unless you've been on the journey. And those who are happiest are quite happy to go on the journey. And I would never forget the conversation I had with Richard, which is to say, you know, Richard, you know, when you look back in your life, you mm. know, will you regard it as being successful? And he said, well, first of all, my life's not over. Yeah. He said, but if I lost it all tomorrow, I'd be incredibly happy because I've really enjoyed the journey. And that was yeah. a bit of a sort of a seminal moment for me mm. that you've got someone who, you know, is incredibly in the moment. It's all about the now. It's all about the journey. It's all about the people. Mm. The outputs become a fait accompli when you get sure. that right. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, looking back at the Goldman's days, must have taken a lot of courage. Like Goldman's, you know, leading investment bank. Your career was probably on an amazing trajectory. And it's interesting people have the courage to jump out and have a go at something else. So uh, I think you should be should be proud of that, right? Yeah. Look, I think. Look, I, I and I won't say that I was I was that brave to start with. You know, yeah. Richard did ring me and say, "I'd like someone to give me a hand." Yeah. Gotcha. It took me about three months to work it out that <laughs> I'd gone around and talked to a whole bunch of people, and I was acting as his advisor sort of finding someone for him. And then mm. I realized actually this is something that I'd really like to do. And he said, well, I'm surprised it took you yeah, that long sure. to work it out. Yeah. And, but that, that, if you understand, and, and he taught me a lot about how do you get people to truly understand what their motivations are. Um, it, it was about, he knew that I needed to make that jump and be willing. It's not like I find a lot of recruitment goes bad when I'm trying to tempt you out of another job sure. to come to the job yeah. that I've got. It'd be like Travis, when you were at UBS, yeah. if someone came along and said, oh, come along to this startup and come and give me a hand. Yeah. Unless you're in the right mindset, yeah. it's a waste of time, sure. right? Because either you're desperate and you're the wrong guy <laughs> or you're in the right mindset and you want to give it your all. Yeah. I've seen what you and Robert built. Um, and therefore, when we look at companies, we strive for finding people at that pivot point where they've realized they really want to lean in. Yeah. Hence, the recruitment processes that a lot are run by people when mm. you're trying to be on your best behavior for 90 minutes are incredibly flawed. It's about... Yeah having five and 10 year relationships with people. And eventually you see them come around the block and something's happened to them where they go, well, I'm now ready to come and spend yeah. time with you. They're the people you want to jump on. For sure. Totally agree. Now back to, um, you know, around the, the topic of the, the, the session around grow your wealth. Yep. Interested in your personal investment journey in terms of what you did, when and why, bumps in the road. Yeah. 
<laughs> Lots of money. So I've never been a believer in what I'd call the traditional portfolio construct, right? So the only diversified share portfolio I own is for the very small super fund that I've got that sort of came about as a result of being an employee for a while. Gotcha. And and it's all almost one of those things that I wouldn't even know it's in there. I wouldn't even no. know what it's returned. Sort of set and forget because I, it doesn't really resonate with me. Yeah. So for me, and look, maybe it's part of my background with Richard in mm. that we were deeply invested in a small number of companies that we really cared about. And what we tended to find is that you care about the things you spend time on. And so if I look at my investment portfolio now, it's about backing entrepreneurs or people that I trust and respect and want to yep. spend time with. And then it's it's having 10 really deep, specialized, special, you know, sort of high conviction bets, sure. if you like. Yeah. And I think if you looked at, say, the Forbes top 500 in the world, the number of people who have created sustainable long-term wealth out of having a diversified portfolio yeah. is very small. Yeah, true. Right? They're all entrepreneurs. They've all got single asset exposure. Mm. And it goes against all the academic literature yeah, about sure. this sufficient markets hypothesis and the frontier and everything else, which never really resonated with me because what you're doing is just dumbing yourself down to the lowest common denominator. Whereas if you're willing to actually do the work and lean into something and take a high conviction mm. bet, not only do you care about it, um, but you really do think about it and you lean into it. And, and, uh, and look, every now and again, it doesn't mean you can't get it wrong. And yeah, I've had sure. a couple of things in my life go really wrong um, where I've lost quite a lot of money. But that clearly has been outweighed by the bets that you know I've trusted and worked and 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 then they come off because yeah you, know, you don't own you know point zero 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 one percent of a company you own ten percent of a company sure. yeah, genuine conviction yeah and and that's why even at Coogee Capital yeah you know, we get approached a lot to become five or ten percent shareholders on a cap table mm. yeah you know, with with a particular entrepreneur and our view is, is that unless we're minimum twenty five sure. and yeah. unless we can turn up to a board meeting and actually feel like this is going to be really meaningful if this mm. either works or doesn't work. We're wasting our time. Yeah, for sure. On that front then, your best and worst investment? Um, look, look, the best investment was um, Virgin Blue, Yep, as it was. So, look, I happen to be – and I, look, I am a true believer in timing being the essence of life. So, you know, 50%, I think, of all great, great things that happen in life are about the position you put yourself in. So, sure. timing being a big Absolutely. part of that. Yep. And so, I just happen to be at the right point where – I joined Richard, the airline had gone really well. Um, yeah, he'd put a reasonably small amount of money to work. Anset fell over mm. and the market shifted and we turned a $50 million investment into a $2.6 billion IPO in 24 months. Now that doesn't happen very often yeah, and I have to sort of yeah, yeah. benefit from that on the way through, right? Sure. And so did anyone ever write a business plan mm. and engineer an outcome that felt that that was in any way possible? Absolutely not. Yeah. But did you have to be in the game to achieve it? Absolutely. Sure. Right. So Richard's up. vision of being in the game at that point and just being around that and sort of mm. following along yeah. meant a lot and, and, and actually sort of trickled down, which For was, sure. which was wonderful. Yeah. Worst investment was, um, the China investment For sure. yeah. where that was probably my stepping out moment of, you know, still within the Virgin fa family, but representing that this mm. was going to work and that I was on the ground and that we built the team and we had a phenomenal CEO and we'd done all the work and we had all the air cover in the world and just red pen risk of regulatory yeah. change meant that, you know, we just got ourselves on the wrong side of the ledger and it went to zero, um, really before we'd even started, mm. which was um, a real shake to my confidence. Yeah. And if I think back now, I think we were trying to be too greedy and too Western mm. um, in what we were trying to do. Uh, yeah. If we'd come in with a different model, I think we'd still be alive today. That's life and you learn it and you move on. Mm. Credit in a way to you and to yourself as was Branson to be prepared to continue to back you, right? And yeah. say so the kids learnt something. Let's move on to the next trade and, and I wasn't, let's see what he goes. And does. I think he was looking for me not to point fingers. Mm. He's looking for me not to jump out the window and say, oh, geez, I failed and I'm yeah. in a ball of mess on the floor. Um, and I, you know, I'd moved my kids there. Mm. You know, they were very young. They were sort of four years old, five years old. This is sort of my big lean-in moment. Yeah, and I, you know, I had reasonable ego, and I'd had a reasonable amount of success to date, but it mm. was all pretend to some yeah, extent, gotcha. and it was a good grounding moment. Gotcha. So, what legacy are you living and leaving? Starting to get a couple of these last Jeez. questions are philosophical Jeez. in nature. So, <laughs> Didn't uh, give, give me that one before this. <laughs> um, legacy, legacy, clearly my family. Yeah, for sure. Right. So, um, I'm immensely proud of the family that Selena and I have built. I think they're great kids. They're very different. They come to life in very That's different great. and frustrating ways. 
but I think they're a reflection of the values that, that we've got. Uh, we've they've been to ten different schools in five different countries, and they oh, speak yeah. a couple of languages. And yeah, they, it's just been great to see to see them sort of come through. And I think all of us believe that our kids are our legacy, right? So I feel like that's not a bad reflection. Yeah, it's great. Um, what was the uh, and legacy. legacy you're leaving? I said you sort of your, your children. So how how old are the kids? I said I've got twins that are twenty two, oh, and gotcha. a, yeah, and the youngest is is eighteen. So just about to leave home. Nearly grown up. But I suspect they'll come around like a boomerang and come back and yeah. revisit. Uh, what do you believe are the keys to successful investment and why? People. Yeah. People, number one. Yep. Um, so that point of do I understand and mm. can I stand in the shoes of the person that I'm investing with? Yep. Uh, do I understand what their motivations are? Do I understand what their alignments are? Do I understand their skill sets and their experience? Um, that's number, frankly, one. Number two yeah. is what I call macro tailwinds. Yeah, you know, it's sure. it, the best entrepreneur, the best manager, the best whatever in the world will never swim against the tide. For sure. Yeah, you know, if the tide's going out, yeah, life's tough, right? Yeah. And the and and the yeah and and um, they're probably the two, and they're timing. Timing's number three, right? Yeah. So it's yeah, you know, where are we in the cycle? What are the competitors up to? Um, you know, it's it, there's, and I think we're seeing a lot of it at the moment, where we've seen this dramatic shift in the cost mm, of capital. For sure. Those that have got you know, dry powder and can yeah. deploy it into a world where risk-free rates are now at 5% plus, um, that's a seismic shift. And you now it's amazing that if you were investing 12 months ago to mm. where we are today, yeah. it's just a diametrically opposite world that you that you live in from, a, from an opportunity set perspective because your risk of doing nothing now is 5%, whereas yeah. 12 months ago it was zero. Yeah, for sure. So 5% is a bloody good return on a compounded base of no risk. Yeah, so sure. therefore, you know, our perspective is opportunity cost of risk has, you know, it's not gone from, mm. you know, it's gone from, you know, what is effectively five to 15. Yeah. And so our, our view is, is that unless you can see an opportunity that's going to return three times money, yeah. don't even bother. It's yeah, not worth sure. the time. Yeah. And so we've sort of raised our bar in terms of things that we're looking for that, that can return good outcomes on the yeah. base of the things that we invest in that we've got conviction on. Yeah. Um, we, we can't see our way to three times money. We're not going to spend time on it. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this episode. If you want to learn more about alternative assets, there's a book here you can read, How You Grow Your Wealth with Alternative Assets. Now back to the episode. Private markets, all the conversations I had, it's all about the people. Mm. You know, their CVs, their background, their experience. Do you trust them? Do you like them? Can you work with them? Yeah. Will, be, will they be there when things get tough? Exactly right. All of that sort of... You know, qualitative assessment is so critical in private markets. Yeah. Probably less so in public, but uh, it's a good point you highlighted. But but I think even it's even more pronounced in public, um, in that they can probably hide for a little bit longer. Yeah. But eventually they get they get found out. And what I love about private markets is the purity of mm. um, you can really get inside a company, sure. you know, with, you know yeah. in a really sort of forensic way. Mm. Yeah, you know, if I look at our latest deal, yeah, you know, we've done six months of DD. We've spent six hundred grand, sort of pulling the company apart. Yeah, we've spent a whole bunch of time with the founder, really understanding what their, mm. their, their motivations are all about. And we've had a couple of toys out of the pram moments where he hasn't been happy with what we've said or the terms we proposed or whatever it might be. And you get to see what they're like. How are they going to be when the chips are down? Yeah, and we're all pushing and prodding each other. You can't do that sort of due diligence in, mm. in, in public markets. Everyone's at arm's length. It's full of PR agents. Yeah. And frankly, I think it's a waste of time. I just yeah. have no interest in, in doing yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. It's the control as well, right? You oh. can, Like you mentioned before, you want a 25% sort of shareholding. You know, that gives you, you can ring the CEO any day of the week. The it's CFO, like, the CEO. We're not say, happy. What's going on? Fix it. Can I help you fix it? Yeah. Or you fix it? Or, you know, where it's, it's often the JV. It's a exactly team, right. Team approach. Um, what are the qualities and character traits separating great investors from everyone else? I, I, I think it's alignment, right? Yeah. So it's that it's that point of, you know, and there's lots of talk of Buffett and there's lots of talk of all mm. sorts of different great investors down yeah. here. But the one thing I've always liked about everything I've heard is it's that it, they put themselves in the shoes of the investors that are asking to come on the journey with exactly, them. Yeah. Right? There's nothing like that moment of jumping off the cliff together mm. and feeling the uncertainty and the intensity of analysis and 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 inquiry that that brings, mm. yeah. I th I think that's the key. So it's a, it's yeah. a derivative of the point around people. Yep. But it's can I can I go into battle with this person together? Am mm. I going to lock arms with them, yeah. or am I being sold a story? Yeah, exactly. Um, and we're constantly searching for that moment of truth together. Yeah. Um, and that, that's the key for me. Gotcha. Yeah. So it's sort of calculated risk together. Yeah. And and look, none of us, unless you're buying, you know, Aussie government bonds at five and a half percent. Yeah, no one knows. Yeah, for right? sure. But 
you, you, you triangulate all the different people around the place that, you know, whether it be secret shopping customers or finding out the banker that wants to sort of find, you know, finance the deal with you or, or is it the management team that's mm. actually willing to say, well, I'll put a million dollars of my own money in, which is the deal we're currently doing, where the guy who's the 2IC, he doesn't need to invest and he's been there for five years, he's built this great business and he's mm. saying, well, I'm going to come on the next journey with you. Yeah. Like that, they're the sort of things I look for where someone mm. offers that up and you go, well, okay, that's not a bad sign that you're willing to stand shoulder to shoulder with me on the same terms and come on the journey. Yeah, and I mean, that's why I was talking about iPartners now for a minute. You know, why well, this will be our third investment we've effectively done together because there's deep sort of relationships and contacts between various people in both businesses. That's right. That, that's why it works. And, and I've got to say, from our perspective, I worked that little bit harder <laughs> to make sure that, that, that I can make sure I can deliver for all the investors that I know that have entrusted their capital with us, yeah. right? And, and every single deal we've done, I've owned... Five, five yeah. to ten percent of, of each of the underlying deals because it's not just a free little mm. I'm just going to throw it out there and and that's that's why I've always that's why I invested in iPartners partners right at the beginning or I didn't even know what it was going to become <laughs> um, because you guys you know both mm. you and and Rob had taken the punt to leave pretty cushy you know yeah you know, great jobs mm. and actually lean in and create something new in a world where you know ordinary investors didn't have access to sophisticated deals it was always intermediated and I think the world demands that now, sure. and I and I and I I I I think we try to bring a Coogee Capital. We try and bring the same level of diligence, which is to say we're gonna we're gonna use our expertise to lean into private companies to hold them to a higher standard. You know, we do prospectus level due diligence on the companies that we invest in. You know, we spend six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars on companies that we invest in that, frankly, you wouldn't spend on a on a business that was going to IPO for fifty million dollars because we want every mm. single facet covered because. Not because, yeah, we want to do it for fun, because we've got our own capital yeah, invested, yeah. right? We we don't want it to go wrong. Yeah, and it goes with your your, your conviction nature of yeah. your philosophy, right? Of investing, exactly. Right. Of you put the money into the due diligence because you're about to, you know, jump off a cliff and big time. You know, very good. Now we're going to finish up with a couple of quick quick fire questions. Okay. Quick fire, um, yeah. So you can sort of, what was your first job? And you're starting as young as you need to start. Yeah, I, I was a um, paper round at Chadston in yeah. Victoria. So, you know, you're a Melbourne boy, you, sure. you know what it's like to sort of deliver papers at 4.30 yeah. in the morning as a sort of 14-year-old. Um, yeah, so there were some cold, wet mornings there. <laughs> Lots of people started as paper boys. It's a good little job. <laughs> and I, I, I loved it because it was, I was always into rowing and everything else. So yeah. it was a great sort of get out on your bike and ride around and, you know, throw the paper. You know, unfortunately, you don't think you get papers thrown yeah. around anymore, but... It was it's a, not, that, not that hilly either, Chadson. No, it's good. not. It's pretty, pretty, pretty flat. But yeah. let me tell you, there was uh, when you loaded it up with the old Saturday, you know, the Saturday age yeah. and the, the Saturday uh, Australian, uh, there was plenty, plenty of work to do. Hey, if you're enjoying this, please leave a review. It's really important to us. We're trying to build momentum around education and better reviews will get more people coming and listening. What's a piece of advice you'd tell your younger self? Trust your gut, yeah, you know, good. particularly around people. Yeah, you know, cool. it's very rarely failed me that when you get that mm. spidey sense of something's not quite right. And the best example for me was when, you know, when Richard first approached me about wanting to work mm. with him and my first um, gut reaction was disappointment that he hadn't asked me to actually come and join him straight up. Yeah, I gotcha. But now I understand he needed me to come to the point of wanting to work for him and, and taking that leap of faith yeah. and the confidence of actually say, I think I'd really enjoy this. Mm. Um, that was a great learning experience of, of learning to trust your gut and, and lean into things. Yeah, it's good. I mean, I barely read CVs these days because my view is you meet someone, you sit down and chat to them. You can typically work out more in 30 minutes than a piece of paper. Completely agree. And even better, it's the old adage of how do you mm. dance when no one's watching? Of course, right? yeah, yeah. So if you see someone at a bar or a dinner party mm. or anything and you just see how they interact with the people around them and frankly – are they a dickhead? You know, <laughs> yeah. Can, you know, can you sit beside them for five five yeah. hours on a transcon or a transatlantic flight and actually have a reasonably free flowing conversation? And do you sit there and yeah. cringe at all? Yeah, if yeah. you cringe, don't go anywhere near them. Yeah, correct. Good flag. <laughs> uh, is there a skill you think is key for building wealth? And I think you've answered this a few times, but I'll just re it's, repeat it's, the it's, question. It's, it's, it's concentration and care. Yeah. It's like, what, what do you care about and what do you spend your time thinking about? Um, now, I suspect my view might change when I'm 70 years old and... Yeah, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Spending more time sort of cycling around the place, but right now, for me, it's about what do I wake up every morning and really care about and mm. think about. I I, I I truly don't believe money is a motivator for people. Right, yeah. it's the journey. 
it's the people they interact with. Mm. It's the, the the challenges they give themselves. Yeah. Um, it's it's the the fulfillment you get from solving problems. Mm. They're the things that people I think care about. And so it, the money's the outcome. For sure. But it's yeah. the journey that's the the key. I agree. Is a habit that you've uh, that you've followed to help you build wealth? Concentration, yeah. concentration and conviction, yep. and and leaning into something and and not being you know, sort of scared to take a risk. And it's not going to work out every time. And I've had some disproportionate losses, yeah. Um, but I've also been fortunate enough to sort of you know most of the time for it to have worked out. Yeah. But it's also I'd say the one thing that's probably I've learned more of the last three or four years, the secret to success is delayed gratification. Mm. So the ability to actually make an investment on the basis that I think it's going to pay off in five years rather than six months. Gotcha. Yeah, there's too much of this sugar chasing, I call it, yeah, where yeah. it's like, oh, I'm getting this phenomenal deal and I'm 5% cheaper and I'm going to get yeah. this and it's going to be, a, and I'm, I'm the king of the world. And very rarely have I seen that pay off. I yeah. think those, and some of our entrepreneurs that, that we work with, it's one of the key things we now look for is that, um, and we recently made an investment in, in a health business where the founder is an incredibly credentialed surgeon, can make you know an extraordinary amount of money every year. He's, he's at the absolute top of his profession. But the secret to his business is delayed gratification. He mm. brought a team of other surgeons with him and said, well, I don't need to earn every dollar today. I can kick it into the future mm. and I'll take those earnings in three or five years. And it's a bit of a realization and probably a little, a little bit naive along the way most entre entrepreneurs, it's a bit like Steve Jobs, right? So yeah. people say, well, how did he build Apple? Well, you know, he took a salary of a, do of a dollar hmm. and took all his conversation in stock. Musk is the same. Yeah. Not that I'm a massive fan of, of, of you know, everything that he does, but that, that sense of delayed gratification, which is I'm happy to kick it down the road because yeah, I believe sure. that what I'm about to build is going to be bigger than just me. Yeah. Um, and it's understanding that dynamic, even if it's not immediately apparent, is, is pretty yeah, important. Yeah, it's a, a discipline and patience. A little bit. Yeah, I, look, you and Rob are the same. I'm a little bit the same. We've all had reasonably big jobs that have paid us pretty good upfront cash. Mm -hmm. But when you start a business and you're willing to delay a lot of that payoff on the basis of what I think I'm going to get to in the end, yeah, very few people are willing to do that. Yeah, you know, I reckon it's less than 5% of the population. Mm, totally agree. I already know the answer. This is cycling, but there's probably a couple of other things. So when you're not working, how do you like to spend your time? Obviously, it sounds like family's a big thing for you. Cycling's yeah. a big thing for you. What yeah. else is there? There's nothing like going along seeing your kids play sport and seeing yeah, them out on the field, you know, fun, yeah. mano a mano, as they yeah. say, um, and just seeing them all in. Uh, and probably, look, we've all done this, but probably the best sporting activity that I can think of as a family that we've always, always loved has been skiing, right? Snow skiing yeah. because – you can be 50 and you can be 18. Yeah. You can go down the same hill, have the same amount of enjoyment. Um, and that's probably the thing that I, I really do enjoy is that, that sort of sense of we're all out there together. Um, yeah. And we happen to live in Europe for sort of 10 years. And so we've got a lot of that probably more than you do in Aussie uh, most of the time. But it was one of those times you can actually do it as a family. You feel like you're all out there and it's just nature and just a great time. Fair enough. Tell us about Annecy. Annecy's, look, Annecy's just one of those places where we lived in Geneva for nine years. Um, it's it's a bit like you you, you go to your, your Gold Coast you know, unit. Gotcha. Um, you know, it's 45 minutes away. Um, it's in France and it's at the intersection of the Alps. You know, the Tour of France goes past you know, every other year. You know, and it's it's a 40-kilometre circ circumference, beautifully clear lake. Um, and it's our spiritual home. It's, yeah, that's right. I threatened to sort of sell the house um, when we came back because I thought, oh, who needs a house on the other side of the world with all the city attendant headaches? And the kids sort of said, over our dead body, uh, that's uh, where we want to get married, uh, which right. as a father means that you know, you're never going to sell it. Um, and it's the place that you know, we can all come together as a family and it's the place we all sort of grew up together and, and it's got enough water activities, enough land-based activities, enough food, enough sort of just space to chill out. Just a good change from, you know, probably more of the intensity that we enjoy in Australia. Yeah, that's great. Really appreciate your time today. But, uh, you know, for anyone listening, if today's stories of entrepreneurial grit and success resonate with you and you're leading a founder-driven private company or family business on the cusp of significant growth, Kuji Capital can be your hands-on partner in navigating that path, uh, you know, to liquidity. Um, you know, if you need more information, visit their website you know, qgcapital.com. And being a Victorian, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing QG properly, but, you know, it's next to Bronte on the coast here in uh, in uh, Sydney. And, and look, Tom and I aren't marketing specialists, but it's it's the beach we live around, yeah. which we love, and hence the name. 
Yeah, so that's great. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, it's been great to have a chat. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Hey, if you're enjoying this, please leave a review. It's really important to us. We're trying to build momentum around education and better reviews will get more people coming and listening.